so let us begin. I want to welcome you all tonight to Bethany Center for Spirituality Through the Arts for this program called Food for the Soul, Relationship Between Food and Spirituality. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome Chef Michael Clunty. Close enough. Close, Close enough. <laughs> he says his kids can't say it either. So, uh, And his wife, Laura. Um, who is a co-owner of the restaurant um, Michael's on the Hill in Waterbury. Waterbury Center, I should probably yes. say. Waterbury Center. Uh, so thank you, Michael and Laura, for accepting um, our invitation. It's a delight to have you here. That's what I would have done. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping details. If you need to use a restroom, um, you can go out in the hallway. There's one straight out this door across the hall. And then there is um, one right around the corner. So if you need a restroom, that's where they are. In the unlikely event that the fire alarm goes off, um, the closest exit is right here at the front of the, the door right here with a staircase that goes out to the back parking lot. So if, it, if you hear it, head that direction rather than back into the building. It would be safer to go out here. Uh, this room is equipped with a state-of-the-art air exchange system that meets COVID protocol requirements. Um, so the air in here is, is exchanging at a rate that is um, deemed to be healthy. However, if you feel com more comfortable wearing a mask, please do. That's, we live in these times. So, um, And I was going to say, if you've moved your chair so that you're not six feet from someone you don't know, but nobody has. You've all behaved yourselves admirably. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about Chef Michael. Uh, he was born and raised and trained in Switzerland. Uh, he uh, wanted to study other cultures along with his Swiss culture. And short, shortly after meeting his wife, Laura, working in the same Swiss kitchen, they relocated to New York City. Michael has worked in a number of different settings, ranging from New York City's four-star Les Pinas. Les Pinas. I knew I was going to get that wrong, too. Uh, to upcountry comfort food at the award-winning lodge at Co Coele in Lanai. I choose those rest all yes, these places just, just to mess with just my name to, as well. <laughs> just to trip me up. Just to go right even with my name. <laughs> And then he went on to the St. Regis Hotel in Manhattan um, and had a wonderful career there, but decided that the wilds of New York City were too wild and he needed to come to Vermont, which were a different kind of wild, <laughs> so and to raise his family. And that led him to purchase Michael's on the Hill. Um, let's see, I'm going to let you talk about a lot of your own stuff, but you do have the honor of being Vermont's first chef of the year. And you've been recognized by, um, one, as one of the country's top culinary talents in the inaugural edition of Best Chefs of America, the first peer review guide of U.S. chefs. He's been featured on television shows and uh, in international publications. He's been invited as a guest chef to locations spanning from a five-year stint with Disney World's International Food and Wine Festival uh, to Holland America's cruise line, culinary cruise line, uh, and, and to locations such as the Caribbean, Australia, and Indonesia. So, uh, Michael and Laura have been awarded Vermont Restaurant Tours of the Year, and the restaurant has received the Wine Spectator Award of Excellence, Sante's Magazine and are recognized as environmental leaders as the first green restaurant in the Green Mountain State by the Vermont Department of Agriculture. So, yes. <laughs> so, um, Laura is going to pass out, if you have not gotten it already, um, an appetizer that uh, Michael is one of Michael's favorites, I think, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about what you're about to have. Here. Right, so that, that didn't sound anything but simple right there, but <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the philosophy was just simplicity, and so this is the wild mushroom tartine that we have on the menu. Right now it's just a roasted mushroom, because COVID has changed a whole lot of things, and wild crafters as well. Um, so there's not that many mushrooms around, we got some chanterelles coming in, and then hopefully the sap is going to come out. 
but yes, Vermont was over a whole state, as I said, New York, Hawaii, back to New York, and then really looked for someone I would like to raise my children. And also to a business where um, Vermont is very much, it reminds me of Switzerland. And not just the way it looks, it's also the way people, or maybe people don't really know that, but the Swiss is very anti-government. So they want to be left alone. <laughs> uh, although very organized and very you know, supported by government, but pretty much just don't want to be told what to do. And Vermont is kind of the same thing where we have so much space that we can do what we want to do that I find my space where I want to be. I'd like to leave somebody in their space where they want to be. And so I really fell in love with Vermont. I've been here now for 22 years altogether, first in South of Vermont, South London area, and now up in uh, Stowe. Yeah. And so the food you're eating, actually, the mushroom tartine is, again, as much local as possible, of course. So it's red hen um, brioche, and then the mushrooms, literally, my, my strongest belief is that nature made it perfect. It's already perfect. And so if you take a carrot or whatever it is, you have a mushroom, just try not to mess it up. As a chef, that's your responsibility because if you hurt food, it's really one of the worst crimes you can do as a chef. And so this one is really just mushrooms, a little shallots, a little garlic, heavy cream reduced down, and then the, the end of it is the gastrique over it. It's a French word for a, a sweet and sour sauce. It's basically just vinegar, and we use sherry vinegar, we reduce that down just like the water back there. Then we add honey, of course, local honey, and then black truffle and truffle oil, and then we puree that up. Truffles are not grown here in Vermont, but not the ones you can eat. They actually do grow here, but you can't can eat them. Uh, the truffle, so the difference between truffle and the mushroom is it both comes from the same plant. It's a mycelin on the, the ground. What grows above ground is a mushroom, and what grows below ground is a truffle. There's 1,500 different truffles out there, and only three of them you can actually eat. Or, or basically like eating pleasure. Oh, wow. I, I, I know that. Wherever I go. And so the, my wildcraft <laughs> friends took me out to the woods and they explained me the exact thing. It was fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Wow. Well, that explains why truffles are so uh, precious. Yes, very expensive. Yeah. So. Well, great. Um, so the purpose for tonight is to explore the connection between food and spirituality, and, um, and that's what I have um, asked, uh, Mike, or told Michael that we're going to converse about. Um, and one of the ways that I understand spirituality is that, is to determine or sense your own passion for things, that, that your sense of your spirit, what you're passionate about, is, um, is a way of expressing your, your spirituality. So the first question I want to ask Michael tonight is, uh, how did you discover that cooking was your passion? <laughs> like most things, it comes out of necessity. So when I was 12 years old, my mom went back to work as an overnight nurse. That way she could only work three nights a week instead of have to work five days, uh, make the same amount of money. But that meant that in Switzerland, when you go to school, you go home for lunch. and so when my mom would come home at 8 o'clock in the morning, she would be sleeping until about 1.30, 2 o'clock, I would have to cook for myself lunch. And after a while, having to make hot dogs and eating whatever, I knew how to heat up and do whatever, I really got interested in, in how to, well, nourish myself. You know what I mean? It was just, it, it, it was, I wanted to learn from her. She was actually a really good, she wasn't a chef, but she was a really good cook. So then I really got interested in that. And then it just became, the restaurant, I just needed to find a place. Where do I fit in? And I tried a couple of different things. In Switzerland, you're allowed to do different, it's almost like little stages. You can go find out different jobs. And I realized that for me, an office situation may not be what I really look for. So I was already doing dishes when I was very young in restaurants and realized that maybe that is where I belong and it, it was a great fit. And then, you know, somebody did ask me that one time. It, it, they said, do you love to cook? And I was like, well, I actually do. But the bigger thing behind it is to feed people, to make their experience, to just, I am a servant, right? So you serve, and there's only two places you are in your world. You're either being served 
or you serve, and when the time for you to serve is, do it with the best of your ability. Yeah. Because if I not, if I not use, but right now we're using what, Panasonic? So Panasonic is serving me right now, because microphone wouldn't work, they didn't do a good job. And if you come to Michael's on the hill and the food is not good, then I didn't do my job with the service that was lacking. I didn't do my job properly, that's why I take it. Very serious, I will say yes, there is social media out there, and we do have to read through what people have experienced. You take that with a grain of salt because some people get mad and then they just, you know, you can see what goes on. But you get this information. That's where my passion is. I really, I would like to make 100% of everyone that walks through the door perfectly happy. What is a challenge, and most of the time we are able to, and sometimes it's more about what do you do when you're not. And there's a passion too. Yeah. When you do mess up, what you do, what, what are you willing to to make it to, to help to to figure these things out? Because if you can walk out of a restaurant with a smile, even though something went wrong, you did something right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So well <clears throat> so one of the questions I have about spirituality is that um, around food. Is, it is in the eating of it, not necessarily, I mean, it's in the preparation too, but it's creating that experience at the table for folks to relax and enjoy themselves. Right. And is that, that's what you're referring to, right. you know? Well, the wonders of, and there is wonders everywhere if you look. Mm -hmm. And so, just as simple as that as a carrot, if you, if you pull a carrot out of the dirt and you have food, I mean, how amazing is that? We're not even talking about raising animals. We're just talking about the simplest things. And even for a child, I mean, you know, when you have, we, we, we did that with Stowe Elementary School kids and just bring them out into the farms and just, you pull the carrot out of the dirt, you wipe it off, you wash it, you eat it. Mm -hmm. And they were very disturbed about that, that it what would mean you just eat it right like this, like this is, you know, and it's, it's, it's the spirituality really comes in where just follows all the way through yeah. from growing it, eating it. I, I do believe that eating is probably one of the most personal things you could possibly do. And I think that very serious too, like especially in the restaurant where I make your food. You're trusting me that I'm doing the right thing. You're trusting me that I'm buying the right things. And so for me, it was always trying to really find the best quality material, product, anything. And when he comes in, and we used to get this whole lamb coming in, you know, and it, it's just, it's, it's beautiful, it's like you, you see it and, and this animal is, is absolutely gorgeous and now I'm going to make sausages out of it. I'm going to brace the, you know, the, the shoulder and the shanks and I'm going to do all these different things you can make with it. And I'm going to nurture someone else. That, you know, it's, it's, that's what I feel like most of my belief system is where it's just, you can give me something, I make something out of it and now we're having a great meal. And the same thing goes for home or my friends or for anything else. So it's just, just as, a, as a, the name hospitality industry actually means, like you need to be hospitable. Right. And you understand that you're only one little wheel in this you know, Swiss clock that then has to all work together. And if it all works together, it's a beautiful thing. And for me too, with the farms too, it's not, um, I think that the, the, the biggest lesson I learned was when I came to, to Vermont especially was, I'm not the one that delegates what goes on the menu. I'm not gonna put certain things on the menu because it's totally out of season. Or I can't get it locally at all. It's so far out of, of reach that I can't. So yes, we have made lobster on the menu, right? That comes pretty far. I mean, it goes over 100 miles. But whatever I can serve with it, if this is the local leaks and the local corn when it's in season, that to me is really, really important. So tell me how you plan your menu then. Um, um, well, there's two ways. Either you can tell a farmer what he's going to try to grow, and you might have a chance that he does it, or he tells you what his land is good for. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually working with um, Ryan and Jenica from Naked Acre Farms. And he was crazy enough to break virgin ground for a farmer. I mean, usually a farm is passed on generation to generation to generation, and they can tell you exactly this dirt over here, this, this shade, this is this, you can grow this. And he started from scratch, had to figure all this out. And so we worked with him, you know what I mean? If the arugula wasn't absolutely perfect, you can make an arugula puree out of it. You can do all different kinds of things. 
So for me, it's what can you grow? And we use uh, Cherry Cosapa Farms right across the mountain there. Mm -hmm. And so they give you lists every week. They come out with a list and say, hey, look, this is what we got. What would you want? And it's like supermarket, but you get it right. farm fresh. And they, they pick it in the morning. They bring it over in the afternoon. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then again, does the, does the guest know about it? Maybe not. Maybe he doesn't even care about it. But I feel that there is, the French has a word for that. It's called terroir, right? Basically, all it means earth. And it's from where you are. So if it is from where you are, somehow it feels right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it feel, feels, you know, uh, it, and as I mean, it, I'm not 100% local. I'm not, because the root cellar can only go so long until you're so sick and tired of root <laughs> vegetables. And you get really creative about it too. Soups, preserving, pickling, everything that we get. And that's a beautiful thing too, what we do at Michael's on here. We got these five gallon drums. And some of them have tomatoes in it that we just couldn't with the little uh, current tomatoes mm -hmm. that we get. Um, we get uh, what's it called, ramps, right? So we just do all these things that we can possibly preserve that in the winter we have certain things we can pull out. Because believe me, when in the winter you open up one of those preserves, if whatever it is, if it's sweet or if it's pickled or whatever, it really like, the sun comes out again. I bet, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can only fix butternut squash so many ways without... Right, and you, you can be really creative. Yeah. And there is something else, and so the spices, you know, it's just oh, yeah. absolutely incredible that we have spices, and then you have the dried herbs, and you have you just got to create all these things, but um, just going back to necessities, too, where, you know, if you all have these potatoes, you're going to get really creative about what you can do with potatoes. Right. And that's what we learned from, too. You know, my grandmother made this dish where basically, well, during the war they had to, when, you know, food was scarce, they had to, everybody, every, every house was told what to grow. So you had to grow potatoes or carrots or whatever it was. And so she made this dish with this beautiful Swiss sausage because Switzerland's very famous for meat byproduct because everything meat is very, very expensive. And so again, out of necessity. So I always feel like that out of poverty came some of the most incredible foods. And then also like all the, the from, 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 from the tail to the snout, everything was eaten, everything was, you know, and we should enjoy that as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, you talked about spices and you've talked about, in, in your bio, you talked about wanting to experience other cultures. So oh, yeah. what, how do those two things go hand in hand for you? What spices do you use? What, um, well, what if, culture? If, if, what, do you like from other cultures? Right. I think that I'm a very smart man by knowing what I don't know. <laughs> and so when okay. with other food cultures, I was I was raised with a very French cuisine base. Mm -hmm. But when you then look out and you especially come to New York City and then all of a sudden there is Koreatown and Chinatown and there's all these and all of a sudden it just opens up. Mm -hmm. And how can you use those ingredients even in the knowledge that you have? You know, yeah. how do you, there's, there's a funny story. Um, I'm, I'm rotisseur in Les Pinas, and that is you make the meats. You're in the, on the meat station in a four-star New York restaurant. So as a chef, especially aspiring chef, that's, you're, you're doing fine. You're, you're doing great. Like you're something hot. And all of a sudden, the dishwasher comes over and just says, you know, one day I'll show you how to cook a duck. He <laughs> made a joke, right? I was like, sure, why not? Yeah. Well, it comes out. The only reason he was working at the St. Regis Hotel as a dishwasher was health insurance that he couldn't afford in his own restaurant downtown in Chinatown. And he had his own shop. And so in Les Pinas, when you were done, when you were, you know, you worked there for two, whatever, three years, and you leave, you go out, you go to a restaurant. This is going to be in a four-star temple, it's going to be whatever it is. And I want to go to his. And it literally was just a storefront, it was plastic furniture, but I never had a better black bean crab in my life until that moment. It was just, it, it just, it just awakes you. Just like, oh, I did not know, but this is fantastic. And now I'm going through life. Every time I go somewhere, every time I talk to someone, I'm eager to learn. I want to learn more. What do you have to, what do you have to offer me? Right. And if, if, you, if I already know what you're telling me, that's fine too. But then it's always, there's always these, uh, these things where you can, 
just for five minutes, even entertain me with a story. Tell me something new that I didn't know about. So when we were doing these guest chef appearances, we went to Singapore. I mean, we went, Singapore was a startup. We went to Micronesia, Indonesia, and then all the way to uh, Australia. And we just explored. We went off the ship. Every time he was docking, every time he was, we just wanted to go and eat the food. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And again, it's not, it's not a rich culture. It's not a, you know, but it's all about fresh spices and seasonings. And then just, what do you make out of it? You have, you have such a little, you know, but, but what they make out of it is absolutely incredible. And, and, and that to me is, 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 is spirituality too, where you can taste where you are. Mm -hmm. Again, with this whole terroir thing. So yes, if I'm in France, I'm gonna have, you know, foie gras and croissants and whatever. But if I'm in, in Asia or anywhere around the world, I wanna taste what, what do you eat? And I'm, 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 I'm lucky and I'm glad that I literally like pretty much everything. I'm not an Andrew Simmer that's gonna try all this crazy stuff. I don't wanna eat live bugs, but I eat dead bugs. <laughs> but you know, exploring what other people have lived on and explored. And if it is a delicacy in some country, it should be okay for me to try it, at least try it, and just figure out, is this something I can wrap my head around? Mm -hmm. So what would you say the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Uh, probably still grasshoppers, just because it's not on the menus here. But if, if you go anywhere else around the world, I mean, insects become the new protein. I mean, they're new, yeah. again, necessity. And, and so, and I actually did it on, was that Vermont Public Television? I think it was. It was some, something we did, and then we, we tried it out. But there are so many different things. It's not really what itself is. It's what you do with it that makes it so incredible. Yeah. So how was the grasshopper? I mean, crunchy. <laughs> it was a lime, lime and chili, so it was it was actually quite tasty. Yeah. So I could see myself actually, you know, eating it as long as you get behind this whole thing, what it actually is. Right. You know, that's usually what people have a problem with. Right. Because when so when it comes to innards like brain or kidney, sweet breads, mm -hmm. tripe. Oh my goodness, tripe is delicious. <laughs> it is. It's prepared yeah. properly and everything is done right. Yes. Well, I have never had tripe, but my husband has, so he says it's good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good, it, it, I really need to try it someday. Yes, if it's well prepared, it's, it's yes. almost, it, most of the time it's served with something that is not related to it, it's, it's a stomach uh, lining. So it is either like an you know, emotional cream sauce or a tomato sauce or whatever it is. And if prepared right, it's, it's very, uh, it, 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 there's no bite to it, it's very soft, it's, very, mm. it's, it's a really nice texture actually. Mm. Very clean, I'd say. Okay. Yes. Fascinating. So, what's your favorite thing to to cook? When you say, I mean, what do you really like to cook? Hey, um, I don't know. I, mean, I do love steak. I do. I, I'm sorry, but you know, with the whole vegetarian and thing. But I do. But then again, I do build. I build a dish with the vegetable first then the starch if it needs one, and then the protein that it goes with it. But I'm also a big fan for fish and just a simple salad with it. Maybe some shaved fennel, just easy things, easy, nice things. When I go out, I'm really looking mostly for cuisines that I don't cook, that's either Thai. Um, when we're in New York, we're definitely going for sushi. Um, that is an art form in itself, where it really just a combination of rice with whatever, mm -hmm. the sushi does stand for rice, not the seafood that goes with it, it's just right. rice. Mm -hmm. And just to do that right, just to do it right. And then that's where, for me, it's, it's when, you, when you say you love something, uh, I feel like there's a lot, love can be very confusing because to everybody it means something different, but I think right. respect and honor and whatever, to honor the, the carrot, to honor the maple syrup, to honor the person that actually made the maple syrup, and the maple that gave the sap to make the maple syrup. Mm -hmm. So it goes all the way down the line that I can actually then mess up. If I burn it, if I reduce it too much, if I don't use the right ingredients, if it doesn't fit properly. And that is something that is very dear to me. So mm -hmm. I don't want to serve you something that I haven't tasted myself, mm -hmm. that I do not approve of it, and then hopefully that my chefs all execute exactly like I want to. But <laughs> 
mistakes to happen. Yes. <laughs> well, and perfection is hard to achieve. Perfection is a journey, not a destiny. Right. <laughs> That's yes. right. That's probably a spiritual concept as well. It so. is. It is. It is. And, and you know, it, it's it's in the last the COVID switched me back on to hiking. And it's fascinating, because if you put one foot in front of another, do that a lot behind each other, you're on top of a mountain. Do whatever you do, you set up your mind to be. But all you did is put one foot in front of the other. And the same thing with food, too, because every time I saw some new potato recipe, because I'm from Switzerland, potato is huge. So we have roasty in Switzerland, it's just a potato cake, right? It's a potato, it's like a hash brown in some way. But then what can you make from potato, potato souffles, potato soup, potato whatever. And every time I learn something from any ingredient, I want to learn about it. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you switch it from different cultures do different things, and that has also different ingredients. I mean, I was introduced to a rambutan in, in, uh, in Hawaii. And this thing looks alien-like. It has these red hair around it. It tastes exactly like a lychee. Okay. But when you introduce to it, you taste and taste these fruits. I also got introduced to uh, to durian in Singapore. Oh. <laughs> I, I did eat it. Okay. And, and, and it's, it's actually illegal to bring it onto a subway. That's why everything is, in Singapore, everything is punished by $5,000. So if you spit a chewing gum out, $5,000. If you bring a durian on a subway, $5,000. It stinks. Oh, wow. It actually smells. And you can smell it way far away when you get there. Wow. But when you're actually eating it, it's not that bad. You just gotta get over that smell. But that's the whole. That's the experience in it. And that's what we do. We like. We laugh getting this durian, and we like now try it. And it was. It, when you taste it, it really tastes like French cheese with oh, a different okay. texture. Right. Okay. It's interesting, you know. Yeah. As I said, you just gotta be. Just explore it. Just, this whole world is out there to explore. Right. Well, and the people who are eating durian or who are um, eating grasshoppers are probably thinking things that we, some of the things we eat might be odd. I don't right. know what yeah. those are, because yes. they're not odd to me. Right. But, um, yeah. That's right. I mean, everybody trying to do something and, right. you know, figure we out went what to, we went to, Yeah, we went to Italy with my kids, and we went actually got the cheese that has maggots in it. Oh. Right. <laughs> and if the maggots are still alive, the cheese is good. Yeah. And the cheese is absolutely delicious. If you can go beyond that, because it adds this earthiness to it. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, I know, everybody's just thinking, <laughs> what? Right. But, it, but it, it is, it's an absolute delicacy. And as I said, it, it, for generation and generation and generation, someone has been doing this. And I'm like, this, there must be something to it. If I can get beyond the idea of what I'm actually eating, and that's always the whole thing. Who this used to be a brain or, but then what's the difference between a steak? Right. You know what I mean? If right. you're looking at a saddle of a horse, I mean, did you ever look at it as being something edible, or from you know, from a cow, or whatever you're gonna, from a, from you know, So, at the end, you're not doing really anything else. It's just further process down right. the line, and so right. you're, you're only getting it packaged up and whatever. Yeah. But you know, as a kid, I mean, in my town there was a slaughterhouse, mm -hmm. and some of my pastime as a child, I would go and see how animals are broken down. Wow. And that went from chickens to, to pigs to the whole cows to everything mm -hmm. else. In the restaurant that I worked in, I didn't hunt, um, but we got we we made food for the hunters. It's called a pot de feu. You just basically put all the vegetables and the meats and the braised meats into a pot. They take it out, they put it over a fire while they go hunting, and then they bring the deer back, and I'll take care of the deer. And there's a picture of me too. We raised rabbits. I grew up on a very old farmhouse, but my father wasn't a farmer. But the farmers were all around us, so I spent a lot of time taking care of other people's animals. Um, and then we would raise rabbits, also to eat. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely a different upbringing where you do learn that uh, respect the process. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just understand it's not just coming all out of the supermarket. Right. So one of the things you said was that you worked with the kids at Still Elementary School to go to farms and things yep. like that. It's, and it's, um, I find it kind of amazing, although not maybe not, that, um, that even Vermont kids don't know where their food comes from. Right. You know, that they, they don't. Well, I think a lot of grown-ups don't know where their food comes yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you, you just go to the grocery store and you buy, you know, you, you buy all this stuff, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's definitely something that's different here in the U.S. than, so my mom, she's 87 years old. Every day she goes to the baker, every day she goes to the butcher, every day she just, 
goes down the line. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once you ask her, like, why don't you buy more and then you don't have to go all the way back? And she's like, well, I don't know what I want to eat today. You know, maybe right. I want to eat a fish, maybe I want to eat a pork chop, I don't know, maybe I want to eat, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's definitely a little bit of a different way here because we travel further distances. Yeah. Distances are so much larger, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, for me, I was a kid, I had to go pick up the eggs at the farm. Right. There's always this thing where I get, it was kind of like maybe like five cents for every egg that wasn't broken when he came back. It's a dirt road and going with a bicycle and bringing eggs. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, so you, you, you find exactly the right path to go through to not right. you know, break any eggs. So you get a, a 25 cents at the end, whatever. Right, right. You know? Not to mention yolks and That's right. all over you. Yes, and as I said before, my mom too was the one that told me when bread comes fresh out of the oven, if you eat it, it gives you a stomach ache. Right? Don't be laughing. I, I thought like that until I was 19 years old. And then I realized that she was just saying it, so if she tipped the bread out of the oven, I wouldn't break it off and eat it. it was my yeah. I was 19. You know how stupid I felt? That's really, so I told my wife. I said, no, no, no. If you eat bread, it comes out of the oven, you get a stomach ache. <laughs> oh, mothers. <laughs> so, um... So spirituality is related to our experience in the natural world. So um, you said hiking. How are there? How how do you spend time in the natural world? Uh, on, you know? Mostly I'm alone. Okay. But if you're on a trail, you never really are alone. I mean, mm -hmm. but um, it's I get my social um, uh, my social uh, being out, like my social needs out, while I'm at the restaurant. Yeah. Or with my family. Yeah. But then when I'm out there, I'm really trying to find peace. Also, like I'm realizing that every time I go up a mountain, I usually have some really, sometimes even angry thoughts. Mm -hmm. and then on the way down, it just all sort of goes away. It's all just like, no, it's not even as bad. It's not as yeah. bad. You know? So yeah. the spirituality there is just, if you're out in nature, and it's really just you, and it, it, it gets to the point now where, you actually survived what you did. If you go mountain climbing, you yeah. actually made it back and you actually did it all by yourself. So when you look at a big mountain, and again, it's that one step. Right. That first step, but the next right. step, and make sure that you're safe, make sure that you whatever, and then, you know, hey, accidents do happen. So I just right. last December broke my ankle and my shoulder. And oh, I was no. Still skiing. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> that is. But life, you know, enjoy life because yes. it, accidents do happen and you need to deal with it. You just mm -hmm. stay at your home. That's the same thing with, by the way, with your kids, with anyone. Go to the farms. First, yeah. go to the farmer's markets. Yes. If you want to know what's in season, you'll know pretty quickly what's in season. Right. Strawberries, whoo, they come and go. <laughs> yes. That's it. And so for us yeah. too, like we buy a lot, a lot of strawberries the second they come in, and then we freeze some, we make some jam out of it, we just do all these different things that we can use later. Mm -hmm. Because again, if I can make strawberry ice cream in the middle of winter, people are like, yes. wow, because you still right. can taste that summer. Yes. You see how it is when, I do like to wait for it too, but when that first strawberry comes out, when that first, you know, anything that comes in the springtime, if this is mint, when finally mint comes up, or anything that comes up and you just, so happy yes. that winter now is over. Yes. But again, now I'm at the point again where I'm looking forward to winter because right. I just want to, again, yeah, right. just enjoy, I do enjoy the seasons. So, Switzerland has seasons, yes. Vermont has seasons, yes. Hawaii didn't have seasons. How That's did why I'm not in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii. Hawaii is paradise. Okay. And paradise gets, you just get used to it, you know? Yeah. Be careful what you get used to. Because you also get used to things that you probably shouldn't get used to because that's what your new normal is now. Right. And so, but Hawaii was absolutely incredible. Also, this used to be the pineapple island. It's called Lanai. Mm -hmm. Everybody, anyone you tell the world you're living in, in Lanai, they're just like, why? But it's just, used to be the pineapple island. Now there's three resorts on there. Two of them like these luxury resorts and one is owned locally. And the pineapples are still growing. These things are still going. They're not, you know, because I, did, I had to learn about pineapples. Well, the first pineapple that you get is 18 months in, and there's the one you can't even use, really. And then you get another one that's called the sugar one, and then so they, they keep, but they keep growing. Another thing you need to know about pineapples is it is actually a cacti. And I did not know that when I picked it. 
And then we went to the beach, and I went into the water, and my, my, I had all these little tiny cuts. So when you pick a pineapple, be careful. So when you watch people pick pineapples, they're fully covered. They're like, they're, 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 they have a full on cover when they go through the fields and everything else. But now, pine, there's no more pineapples there. They moved it off. Uh -huh. They moved it out of the United States. But if you have yeah. a chance to get to Lanai, it has some of the most beautiful beaches on there. What is it close to? Is it, it's right it's next to Maui. Maui. It's right next to Maui. It's right next to Maui and in between Molokai and Maui. So the Molokai, oh, okay. there's a channel going through and it's, it's a beautiful island to visit. Uh -huh. Yes. It's on my bucket list. Yes. And my, my first son was born in Hawaii. Uh -huh. But you weren't able to give birth on that island, so you had to go to Honolulu to actually give birth. So that's another. Wow. Yeah. It's an adventure. <laughs> it's, you have adventures, you know? Exactly. But again, the food, too, to the locals. And Lanai was a little special because Lanai was 85% Filipino oh. because they were generations past the pineapple fields that they were brought in to, to take the pineapples. They're now mostly employed by the hotels or the gardens for the hotels. And again, you learn new dishes, you learn new customs, you learn new ways of doing things, and especially on that island, family was enormously important. Mm -hmm. And so there was always, there was this market, uh, swamp meat, I think they called it, whatever. And it was, it was just, you got these, 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 these lump lumpias, okay. they're just, yeah, lumpias. Uh, delicious, just like spring rolls, you know, it's oh, just, okay. and they're filled with anything and everything, and, and just, again, homemade, mm -hmm. fresh. Mm -hmm. With too natural to that place in some way. In North. some ways, right, exactly. Some ways. Right. So, and then totally you have to get used to poi. Right. <laughs> or poi is something else. That is to, to, to an outsider, they call us Howley over there. But um, uh, if you, poi is made out of terra root and it's this paste. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's hard to get by the texture. But then they make, they make a delicacy out of it and that's fermented poi. Oh, yes. Yes, but again, try it. Always try it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that to me too is, is for just for being in the restaurant business, being a chef. Just because one chef at one point, maybe or it was maybe your mother, or maybe someone that cooked for you, whoever it was, maybe didn't do it exactly the right way, so you got away from it. Right. Because somebody said, like, I never tasted asparagus like this, because what he grew up with was canned asparagus. Yeah. Right. And so yeah, well, what you know, and then they have. So trying to make sure that keep trying it again, different places, different you know, things. Mushrooms too. My father-in-law, who did not like salmon and did not like mushroom, liked when I made it for him. Just because mushrooms in itself can be done in so many different ways, mm -hmm. that number one, it's almost texture of meat. Yes. If you do it, you can do it with, with spices. You can just do it as simple as just grilling them. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and different mushrooms have different flavors Absolutely. too. Absolutely, so, yes. I saw a meme on Facebook um, last week or so, and it, <laughs> it said, wouldn't you like to be the first person that figured out which mushrooms you could eat and which ones would give you hallucinations yeah. and yeah. which ones would kill yeah. you? I, I'm not the first one. <laughs> I'm not the first one. Right. Yes. No, and that too, it's like over generations and generations, this knowledge has been passed down and passed down and passed down. Mm -hmm. And I really, um, that with wildcrafters too, like who still right. wants to do something? Right. You know, right. And, and are we losing our, our relationship with nature that has nurtured us for so long? Mm -hmm. And now we're just, as I said, we just go to the supermarket and can get strawberries in the middle of winter. We can get tomatoes in the middle of winter. We can get anything we want. Mm -hmm. But when you see of what actually has to happen to get that there, right. it just makes your hair stand up. It's just not. Right. It's just not correct. It's just right. not right. And right now too, like right now, I have we call it the wall of tomato in my freezer. <laughs> and so what my farmer does, it, Ryan brings me second tomatoes. They're not, they're not as pretty. They sometimes explode a little bit, but they taste absolutely amazing. And all we do is we just take the coat out and we crush them, we put them in the buckets and freeze them. So we have buckets and buckets of frozen tomatoes right now. And also helps the freezer to keep the cost down, by the way. Just oh. full freezer costs less than an empty freezer. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> side effect. But then in the winter we pull it out. Yeah. And then we can make bouillon base. We can make the lobster in the winter is served with a tomato stew that's made with fennel and potatoes and, and you know. So it's just help the farmers out and just really buy whatever you can. I always be happy when I buy out the farm. When I buy out whatever they have at the end of the you know, there's their growing season because that's how they calculate theirs. And by the way, I'm running always ran my business when I finally got to the point where I have my own business, just like a farm. Because Vermont has its seasons. Season goes on and then it goes off. It goes into off season, your business is gonna slow down. So to every out of towner, that is gonna be a very big surprise when November comes around. So put it away, put it aside. You have a, you have a barn where you put the hay, you put it away so you have food for the animals. So same thing for me, I just, you know, my, my, my barn is the Union Bank. And so I'm like, you know, put it away when you can and then you have to use it when. And for me too, like holding on to your staff, especially in these times right now, probably one of the most important things. And it always has been to me for 20 years. That's why we're actually cruising right by Knockwood. That we can pick from 20 years of experience and 20 years of employment and people still want to come back. Yeah. You know, so treat them right. And also for the chef, when they see what we're cooking with, it's a totally different experience for them as well. Right, right. There's a big difference between opening a can and I go actually making your tomato sauce. Yes. You know, from fresh tomatoes. <clears throat> right, right. So um, when you're in keeping your staff, that's that's um, that's a spiritual uh, concept as well to treat others the way you yourself want to be treated. To you know, and, and so right. that. Um, that's an important thing. How did how did you cope with that during COVID? Um, I, I don't treat my staff any different than I treat my family. Mm. I, I want them to be okay. Yeah. Um, I want them to be okay, but then uh, you you've been raised to believe in a certain thing in a certain way, and it's really hard halfway through to change that. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that one of my employees is not going to be um, good for my family, he needs to go. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to do. Sure. Because I, I truly believe that everyone can do what someone else can do as well, but you have to be willing to do so. Yeah. And for us, it's the schedule is made this way, family meal is made this way, everything is made in with, with the thought of others. Yeah. You know, if we have someone that is a vegetarian, we're not just going to serve chicken fingers for dinner, you know what I mean, or chicken wings or whatever we're going to serve that night. Right. We're going to have something else. So to care, and that's what really what you want. You want someone to care. Right. You know, and if, if I'm the one that owns the business doesn't care, then then just going to go right down the line of, of figuring it out. And to me, because I was a dishwasher, and. That, that was an awakening in itself. So I was very young, I was 12 years old, um, and instead of really taking me aside and showing me how the job is done, and this is a team effort, oh, it was not a team effort. <laughs> you, you just walk in and there's piles and piles of pots and pans that have been piled up because they won't have you start until a certain time of day. So you walk in and it's filled up, and I, ever since, it came within this, do it, now do it faster, do it better, and always learn how to, you know what I mean, watch another dishwasher. Well, how does he do it? How is he getting it done? Why am I not as fast as he is? Why am I? And so that goes for everything that I've done later. Mm -hmm. You know, it just and ended up cooking in one of those culinary temples that comes with its own, you know, craziness. Mm -hmm. And that's why we said we moved to Vermont was, I didn't like that family environment mm -hmm. because daddy was constantly screaming. Screaming and screaming and screaming. So if your kitchen chef keeps screaming at you, just like if you're a parent, your kid gets used to it. That's just the way we communicate. Yeah. And so for that, I didn't find um, my place there. I really wanted to run my own politics, my own ways, yeah. my own, make good food, but have fun doing it. Yeah. You know, and we used to come here actually to Montpelier to pick rams every spring, and then we would go for brunch at Kismet. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was like it became a ritual. Yeah. And you do these things and you bring your family with you and you bring your own family with you too. And you really create an environment that is, people want to be there. Right. You know? Right. 
Right. That's what also we spend a lot of time, you know, you spend 10, 11 hours every day, five days a week, mm -hmm. and uh, have some fun with it. And as I said, respect comes with it. Yes. And if I want to be respected, then that goes both ways. Yes. And respect is never given, it's earned. So. Yes. That's right. So, let me uh, open the floor up to questions from you. What has a reason for you that you'd like to ask Michael about? Yes. Michael, how do you go about trying out different dishes? What? How where does your, them? Yeah, how do you create them? Where does your inspiration, I mean, I sort of get where your inspiration comes from because right. of your experience. But how do you know what, what food you're going to put on your menu? Right. So when you, when you, how would you say that? Your taste buds learn. Right? but you eat the whole dish, you might not learn fast enough. You might just have so many different ingredients. So really find out by testing. Test your ta taste buds. Go and have, eat some ginger, small amount, because it's really spicy. But eat it, and then eat a little honey, eat a little chili, and all of a sudden you realize, could that work together, right? And so after a while of just constantly tasting, eating different foods, you get a, I would call it an echo. So I put, I put green beans in my head and I can actually taste green bean, just memory of what it, and you, you know what a strawberry tastes like every spring when it comes, just when it comes around, you're like, oh. So when you can actually imprint that, then you can start playing around, you know? And then for me too at the restaurant, it's not, for me, Michael's on the Hill food is really a, 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 a simple way of preparing food. You know what I mean? I want you to taste the lamb when you taste the lamb, the pork when you eat the pork. So try never to outshine really what you're trying to do. And I'm telling you, like, that the stronger flavors, as in especially the spices, can immediately totally outpower what can be a really good thing. Because where the French uses a little bit of cinnamon to flavor things, in Indian cuisine, cinnamon is a binder, like it actually, you put it in spicy and it gets you a totally different thing. But just taste the individual ingredient and see what it does. Even with the herbs too, you know what I mean? Then all of a sudden you realize like, oh yeah, rosemary. Then you have thyme, a little bit less, and then tarragon, what does it do? And then imagine eating a piece of fish. Now what goes well with that? And so you come up with these dishes, and then later on you do understand how certain things work together. Like there's like, you know, the trinities of like potato, potato mushrooms, and leeks, right? So you have the onions, you have the, the mushroom, and you have the potato. So you know which ones are going together, but then with the way you put it together, how are you going to make this work? So for us to come up with dishes too, it's also we have menu meetings where we all sit down, and there is no... There's no stupid idea that someone has. It's just maybe puts your mind into a different, you know, somebody says, you know, I want to do this and this and this, but then we're like, yeah, but it doesn't really fit with the restaurant theme or whatever it is, maybe you can do it as a special. Or take ideas and morph it into something that it becomes. But I'm telling you, it's, it's just, and I don't want to say, oh, it's such a great art. You know, um, Picasso didn't paint the way he did it towards the end. He painted beautiful just landscapes and, 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 and stills and whatever because he learned also from the old masters. And so when you learn over time from someone else how to do something, you might be able to just change it. But not for the change sake of it, but just maybe you can improve it. Think maybe you had a dish and you're like, wow, changer would work really well with this. Or it's a little chili or a little, little something sweet or something sour. Most of the time it's actually sour that dishes scream for because especially in French cuisine that is quite heavy with butter and you know butter and cream and all these things you need something that just goes fresh can be fresh fruit or fresh vegetables itself raw vegetables bring a nice crunch and freshness so when you're kind of bored um, I'm always going with you have about an attention span of three seconds if I sit up here and I talk for three seconds you start being like what's going on your taste buds have the same thing. So if you, if you taste the most perfect food, if it's the most perfect puree ever made, you're gonna eat a few times and you're like, okay, well I need a little something else, and that's called texture. 
or acid or something that just like keeps your mouth entertained. So play around. There's nothing go wrong. I mean, <laughs> my, yes, my mom would take us as a, as a family as guinea pigs before she would give it to other guests. So have a guinea pig ready for someone else to taste it. But if you really are truthful to yourself, you can taste it and be like, wow, this feels really nice. You know, this feels good in my mouth. I want to have more. And then you know that you did something right. Thank you. I have two How do I fall, what? How did you fall back in love with cooking after being a dishwasher and having that? Uh, I always love to eat. So <laughs> I, I just really wanted to find out, uh, one, I was a dishwasher, but then I would always get you know, lunch or dinner and the guys in the kitchen made it. So these guys were all wearing these whites, you know what I mean? I'm wearing this you know, plastic apron and I'm in there and I'm, you know, at the end of the night, I just, so I wanted to become like them. I wanted to see like, well, they're doing this. I want to become like that. Then I see the kitchen chef who's just basically expediting. And he's like just putting on little garnishes, telling everyone what to do. And I'm like, ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> but I was so young, so I had to learn. And literally in Switzerland, it was seriously, I became um, more like a culinary mechanic, right? I'm not, I'm not creating. I wasn't creating any dishes. I didn't create any dishes until pretty much I was sous chef in Hawaii, you know, like you just do what you've been told. This is how we do it, this is how you make it, this is how you cook it, this is how you serve it. And if you did it, yeah, that was to be paid. So for me it was, how do I make this food? Because someone, the kitchen chef who knows, and then the sous chefs who delegate that to me, make them happy. That's all it was, it was just, just trying to keep the chef off my back, just like make them happy, make them happy. And that is repetition, 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 just like martial arts, just like anything out there. You do it for 10,000 hours, you're not good at it, you probably should stop. <laughs> but if you do it for 10,000 hours, whatever you're doing, you're probably gonna become really good at it, if you always wanna become better at it. And for me it was, you know, you, you go up the, this ladder, and I was, I was realizing that the more I went up the ladder of the career, the less I was doing what I liked doing. And that was actually cooking food and getting food in and touching the food, you know, preparing the food, doing all this. You always had staff to do this. You just, yo, and that's, that, that got me into trouble with the union one time because I said, I'm basically babysitting. For 10 hours out of my 12, I'm babysitting. And that, that did not go over very well. But that's <laughs> literally what I was doing, trying to keep people from not fighting with each other. To, you, you know, this guy took this guy's peeler and this guy, it was like kindergarten. I mean, it's just, some people don't, you just guide them in the right direction, and that's what I was doing all day long. And then all of a sudden, I was like, you know, I really like to cook. I really yeah. do love to cook, and then also show other people how do you make a better chocolate mousse? How do you make a better chocolate torte? How do you make a, you know, what do you, how can you improve on what you're doing? Mm -hmm. So I always, I always love to eat. So if I want to eat, if I want to eat, I need to learn how to cook, self-sustained, that I can cook for myself. But <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know that sort of, well, I know that obviously COVID disrupted the whole restaurant business model and stuff. Just a bit. Just a bit. Are you starting to see some of it come back, or do you think you might have some return to normalcy in the next year, um, year and a half? And so COVID actually, um, we closed for three months when COVID hit, and, and it, it, it was one of the worst days of my life where I had to lay off everyone because I was afraid that my entire business is gonna go upside down, that, um, that I'm not gonna get my staff back. I didn't know what to expect. I wish I knew then what I know now. It totally changed. What also changed is that 300 plus families moved to Stowe because they moved out of the Boston area, New York area, New Jersey area, they moved into Stowe. Every second home around me was all of a sudden full. Every Airbnb was full. And this was new clientele. And so all of a sudden, we reduced the seating in the restaurant to keep people apart. So we filled up every night. And then we added a few more tables because it got a little bit more relaxed. And we kept on filling up the tables. And so we just kept going with it. So at the end, COVID did very, very well for business. The, the issue was immediately was supply. I couldn't because 
it was amazing how far this, the, 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 how would you call that, the lack of employment went. I couldn't get calamari because they wouldn't clean it at the docks. They have not enough staff on the docks. The crab, I couldn't get crab because they wouldn't clean the crab, they not enough staff. So it was always like trying to, how do we cope with that? So the, so the crab cake became a smoked chow cake for a while. So we just had to switch things around, trying to, and I was on the phone a lot with the purveyors and the farmers, because when COVID hit, the farms weren't open yet. They had nothing, like I couldn't get more than what I already had. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what, what really was a blessing was that my staff stick around. They all came back off the COVID, and some. And some more people were hired. Because all of a sudden we did this business and, and it was just, yeah. But, but just the not knowing, that unknowing was just, you know, and I also, I was in business already for 18 years. You know, it was, it was if you were a brand new business, this was brutal. You know, if you were new into this business, I mean, you know, and now already we had, and then we got some government support to keep the, the PPP loans, I could hold on to the staff, hire even more staff and have, you know, all these things ready to go. But for me, it was, was more like trying to get the food into the house that we can actually then prepare it. And sometimes we had to adjust the menu. That was just it. Like, sorry, we couldn't get any tenderloins. We couldn't get any. But then again, if you had local purveyors, and the other thing was Northeast Family Farms was a co-op. Their meat were cheaper than getting the stuff from the Midwest because Midwest ran out of stuff. They did the, with the, the whole planting. So all of a sudden, local became cheaper than anything else. Yeah, and so the moment the farms came back with vegetables, I was just so happy to, we reopened in June, on June 12th. So we just were so happy to just see the whole thing going to somewhat of a normality. But even now still, it's uh, trying to find a cook, trying to find someone that still wants to work in this business is tough. It's tough. And I realized too, we adjusted a whole lot. Like I hired more staff to just make sure that my crew does not burn out. As a prep cook, you know, we, we start at one o'clock now instead of 11 o'clock. So it's just all these things that we've done to make sure that the environment stays the way it is. Uh, this goes back into that creative process you were talking about a little earlier. You mentioned earlier that you start with vegetables before you add the meat in it. I'm trying to understand that as a creative process. Like, how, how, how does that work? What, you know, what, what does your imagination do that uh, works with the vegetables first and then into the meat? Right, so what it is is that <laughs> you don't need to start with, with, with the vegetables, but I have a piece of meat or a piece of protein that I want to lift up off the plate, really make it better. So right now we're going to, actually by the end of this week, we're going to go on with a spice rolls of loan of venison. Right? And so it's all this red deer, beautiful, spice roasted, this and that. But how do I bring this from the vegetable point of view off? So my mother used to make this red wine braised cabbage. And I love red wine braised cabbage, especially in this season. It's just like, I love this season when it becomes more of the spices, more of the warm spices. And that's what red cabbage is braised with. And then the chestnuts and, and, and so forth. So. What I'm saying is, when you want a piece of fish, you know, I'm not saying that they all taste the same, but they're very similar. So think about what you want to serve it with that. And also the venison can be served in so many different ways. But the vegetable was there first, so I thought like the red wine braised cabbage, the venison, ooh, that would work well together. And so we start doing that. And then that one is very dramatic anyway, because it has spatzli on it. They call it knöpfli in Switzerland. So you, you finish a dish, we wouldn't, you know, if I say first, it's more like it has to all come together. But don't go with right away, like from the protein and then add whatever you, you know what I mean? Just go with, well, I want to really lift this up. With, you know, fish can be braised fennel. It can be all these different beautiful things you can do. And spend probably more time on making the vegetable part of it than you actually get later on with the meat. Because for me, grilling a piece of meat, it just grilled a piece of meat, right? But what you're serving with it, the potato gratins or the, 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 the maple glazed carrots or whatever that is you're gonna serve with it actually takes more time. And maybe that's just for me, but that part's actually harder than cooking a nice rare loin of venison. Because it, it just takes, it takes more attention and it takes more detail 
for that. So I'm saying like, put the passion that you have for your meats the same as you do for your vegetables. Does that help? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, oh, on, there's one in the back, yeah. Yeah, um, when you use wine to cook, um, do you have like a go-to red wine, or does it matter if it's really a, no. like a fine wine, or can it be a cheap wine? Hey, um, don't do it. Don't don't go don't go expensive. You know, like right. you know, if you if you can afford it, great. So the wine you're gonna serve with the venison, well, use that to cook with it. But if you drink a nice glass of wine and don't think that, that that wine is gonna shine through in red wine braised cabbage that has onions, apples, and cider in it, it's not gonna happen. If you make a red wine reduction, even then, so it means like, if you're, if you're ever gonna try this, then you really should, this is a good one. Take red wine and bring it down to a glaze. It's actually now syrup, let's say. If you taste it, it's so tart, but now you cook a piece of salmon. Okay, now you take that sauce, that's just that red wine, you didn't season that wine at all, you seasoned a piece of fish, put some of that red wine over that, now we eat that salmon. And you tell me again, what happened is with that salmon, it just immediately just got from this, that I do like, is this fatty fish, and became this light fish, just because of the acid that cuts into it. So what I'm saying is, don't cook with bad wine, but don't cook with expensive wine, do not. And would it matter like Merlot or Pinot or? What would you use? <laughs> no, as I said, is I would, if you can, follow through with it. If you have, you know, if, if, you, if you're gonna drink Merlot with your, with your dish, then cook with that Merlot if you can, or get a cheaper one. Um, but are you gonna taste it? No. Literally, there is no way, like even in my poached pears that I do, and there's just basically a lot of red wine that you poach these pears in. And when it's finally done and you got the chestnut puree and you got the gingerbread cookie, there's no way you're gonna tell me what's that wine. When you taste the wine as it is, there is people out there that can tell you exactly where it comes from, the year, this and that, but it has to be in that state. The second I touch this and re reduce it or add flavors to it, there's no way. So I would not spend too much money on wine. I was thinking about risotto, but even there, you just use a little bit of wine, but even there, like especially there, I probably will go with the wine you're gonna, or the, the same one as you would probably serve later on. It's also like, especially if you cook for two people or just even for yourself, how much of that wine you're gonna wanna drink later on so you can use a little bit to cook with. <laughs> it's like truly a child, you know. <laughs> how do you decide when something should be removed from the menu? Well, first, if, if, if the farmer runs out, that's number one, that it's gotta go. Um, two, well, we do have numbers, we got a POS system, so we'll see what sells and what doesn't. But just because it doesn't sell doesn't mean it's not good. It just means that, like, if I put sweetbreads on a menu, it doesn't sell very well, but the people that do order it love it, you know? So it's, it's not just because you wanna have a, a collect, how would you say that? an eclectic menu, like the menu needs to be balanced out, right? So you're gonna have the steak and potato kind of guy. You're gonna make that guy happy too, while well, you're gonna make the vegetarian happy as well. So you're trying, you're, this is your goal as a restaurateur, you're really trying to make everyone happy. As we know, that's impossible. But we try, we really try, from the moment you walk in to the moment you walk out that you're actually really happy, that's our goal. And if we mess up, then we made a mistake. And hopefully we're able to fix it Maybe not. So what goes off the menu seasons definitely change everything. It's just, if we run out by the end of the season, also like, as I said, with the strawberries, like you wanna have that. You wanna change it into the strawberry, you know, we have a strawberry shortcake that goes on the menu. Or things like this that we, that we deal with that, when we were talking about before, like when you're a chef and you just wanna create. And then you're gonna start choosing things that do not really belong at this time in this place. So the farmer should tell you, well, this is what I got, now go make something out of it. Right? And so the talent becomes, as a chef, it's always what you make out of what you get. I was also cooking in the military. In Switzerland, you have to go to the military. And so I was also cooking in the military because that's what the military does. They're going to ask you, what are you, a car mechanic? You're a mechanic. If you're a chef, well, you're going to be cooking. So you did that. So I was cooking, and even there, it was, uh, you have a whole, what do you guys call that here, a platoon, and a troop, uh, a group, whatever, it's together. And, 
You cook for them. Well, guess what? You better be good because these guys have been out there in the field getting doing whatever they've been doing. And they come home and they want to have some food. And I remember at one time I entirely overseas the mac and cheese. Put way too much white pepper into it. And it was so spicy, but it so happened that that was a really cold night and that was exactly what they wanted. But usually you really have to be, you know, and even there, like when you get substandard, what we call it, substandard stuff, like we would get the, the pork shanks, that was just like the pork shank gets cut and then you have the leftovers, whatever. But even those are fantastic to cook with. And what we would do is, and this is you learn in the military, you actually cook the shanks right off the breakfast. You, you, you bake, you put them in these huge insulated boxes and then they get transported for wherever you're gonna go. And when you open up the box, perfectly cooked. It's, it's, <laughs> Yeah, because also, like, when, when you're in the kitchen, this maybe just look too much information, but whatever. The burners that we had was gasoline, and you put the gasoline on the pressure, and then you light it, and the flames go, I mean, at least six feet high before they get hot, and then it comes down. And I was always thinking, like, well, was, if we were under attack, well, I'm going to cook a six-foot flame up in the air. <laughs> but, you again, you learn from everything you do and how to cook like that. And that was also, by the way, a pot au feu was exactly like that cook in the pot nice and slow. Probably one of my favorite foods. It's all in one pot. All in one pot. I like braised meats. I like lamb shanks. I like pork shanks. I like shoulder. I like any of these things that are just fall off the bone. And then just the vegetables and the broth and everything else that comes right with it. So um, a question I have is, do you think, um, I think I heard you on one of your radio ads one time talk about uh -oh. it being healthier to eat because that's when the food is mm -hmm. at its best, and it's best for us. Is that something you're it still is. advocating? Or I do. I'm a very much advocate that whatever you eat, you are. Mm -hmm. End of story. Point. Drop the mic. Yeah. You are what you eat. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, you eat, if your diet exists of something in that diet, because you got so used to it, because you pretty much, when I say you are what you eat, it's pretty much whatever you put in your grocery cart. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Now. I'm not supposed to have cookies, and I always, you know, like, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't have cookies. I want cookies, but too many of them. Balance it out. Balance everything. And that comes right back to that. And the local food, yes. Eat, eat as much local as you can. It makes sense. Keeps a dollar here, too. Yeah. You know, like my dollar that I make at the rest in the restaurant, then it goes right down the street. And when you have a farmer, you know, like a long time ago, um, Winding Brook Farm, the roof caved in, it was years ago, and the roof caved in, and within two months, the money was back together that we could put the, 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 the roof right back up. So you're supporting the local guy, why not? Right. As I know today, it's very easy to get caught up, you go on Amazon, you buy everything, it's delivered to you, it's 24 hours, I don't know how to do it, but they can do it, maybe something. But, so, Look, look at the local stuff, and maybe you have to go a little further. Maybe you gotta go a little, you go on a journey, whatever. But yes, for yourself, for your body, for whatever you do, you are what you eat. So you can only excuse so much the way you feel and, and, and the strength and, and how awake you are and how tired you are or whatever it is has a lot to do with your food and when you're actually eating it. Yeah. And there's nobody out there that can really tell you. They can some guidance that to go. Oh, you should do this. You need to try it. Should you eat like, a, you know, how does it go? Like you should eat like a king for breakfast, a peasant for lunch, and like a poor person for dinner. Uh, it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. What works for you? Yeah. And for me, literally what, what, what I started doing, you know, it also was a COVID thing. When you actually listen to your mind, when you're hungry, what's it telling you to eat? And I'm not right. saying like you gotta go right away to, you know, fast food or whatever, but what is it telling you? Do you want fish? Does fish sound good to you? Like, go with the healthy stuff. Try to go with the healthy stuff. Fish, do you want a salad? Do you want a steak? What, what is it? Your mind will tell you what you need. Because after a huge hike and I'm exhausted, my mind goes just one screaming, calories, just give me calories, just give me something and give it to me fast. Then maybe have a pizza. Yeah. You know, if you go up on Washington, come back down, who cares? Have a pizza, it's all right. But if you have not done much during the day, maybe that not be the best meal for you right now. So how much salad, how much vegetables do you eat? How much protein do you eat? And how much of that protein do you actually gonna burn up afterwards? 
Yeah. So treat, treat yourself right. It was literally treat your body like it is a temple. And it will take care of you. The better, the better you take care of your body, the better it will take care of you in the long run. My, my, my uncle had to say, and he said, getting old is not for sissies. <laughs> and, and I can see it. I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I saw, you know, um, it, it's just, it's almost like a preparing, preparation. And as much as you prepare, life's going to throw a curveball. So might as well take care of that body that when a curveball does come, it's easier. Like when I broke my ankle and my shoulder and all these different things, those things happen. Well, and it's, I think that's uh, getting in touch with your body, too, is, you know, because your body does, you know, when you stop and listen, yes. it does tell you. Yes, it does. You know. And it wants to move. Yeah. It wants to move. That's the biggest thing. Go for walks, uh, ride a bicycle, do something if you, if you, especially, if, you know, look at what we used to do. We had to use gather, hunt, do all these different things. We didn't have a lot of time to sit down. Right. There was no me time sitting there doing nothing. So this, <laughs> always, I'm always like, I, I get antsy. I need to do. I need to walk. I have a yeah. dog. I love my dog. Like we go hiking a lot. Yeah. We always walk. We always go for walks. We always do things. Keep moving. A body yeah. in motion stays in motion. Yeah. If you stop, it's just you know. I, uh, <laughs> and I broke my ankle. So I broke my ankle on my shoulder. Took. They fixed this really quickly because it was sideways. Now they they fixed this, but they couldn't do the shoulder until my foot was right. Because I couldn't even hop around. So I was out for six months. Wow. And I couldn't walk. I couldn't do anything. I was rolling in a wheelchair into the kitchen. It was just horrible. But what saved me was that I was eating healthy. Mm -hmm. And what it does when you move is you take in one of the most beautiful things. It's oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good food. Have, and especially here in Vermont, the, the most amazing thing is we have all these, these woods, these trails, these, I fell in love with it. Totally fell in love with it. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Liz, how would... I just wanted to um, reflect back on something you said earlier that um, you are grateful to the food and to those that have put it together, that have yeah. made the, that. And it reminded me of a book that we had studied here at Bethany, um, Braiding Sweetgrass where the author um, is an indigenous person mm -hmm. and she talks a lot about being very respectful of the earth and the and the food that you gather and and thanking thanking the, the earth for the food and, yes. and I just really was I I was very impressed with your saying that. Yeah. I just think that's I think one of the most for me, one of, one of the, 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 the biggest disrespect is if it goes in the garbage, right? Food that could have been eaten. And even if it is lobsters, I know it's a huge food cost, but before I do anything else with it, I mean, make something out of whatever there is. So and that's why it's a, when I say to you like, oh, it's nice to create things. Sometimes it's nice but also to create for some of the vegetables that are in the bottom of your refrigerator that mm, been in there for a little bit too long. <laughs> but make something out of it. You know what I mean? Make a soup out of it. Make a broth out of it. Make soup and then freeze the soup. Then you have soup for whatever. But just when it goes in the garbage, it really is the last thing or the compost, wherever it goes, right? So try not to do that. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't peel our carrots. Why would you peel a carrot? What's that for? You want a little bit of bitterness. Bitter is good. Bitter is totally fine. People don't, they, they think they don't like bitter, but actually you do. You just, it needs to be subtle. You know, it's, it doesn't have to taste medicinal, but it, there has to be a subtleness with bitterness in it as well. So explore at home, especially when you say with creation. Okay, so your refrigerator is your, you know what it is. So, so go through your refrigerator, grab out everything that is starting to, to go. That's how we have our family meal. We sit down at 4 o'clock every day. We have a family meal at the restaurant. That's when we get rid of things. We are already going into the, day, the, the zone where I don't even want to question if it is, you know, if we should send it out or not. If you've got to ask if you want to send it out or not, don't send it. So we eat it. We eat really well. So, you know, that's another thing, too, for the family itself. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yes. The mushroom piece you uh, had served to us earlier, yep. um, in the theme of uh, the spirituality of uh, food, uh, it, it, 
it was one of those things that when you run across it, you have to spend time with just a little bit in your mouth to uh, feel it and uh, really experience it. Is there a way of learning how to do that without spending 10,000 hours? Uh, because motion technique. Well, I'm, 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 you know, how do you decide on the various? Is there a, a trick, a way of learning a little bit about how, what the, uh, those combination of food that you go? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So there is, as I said before, there's things called balances that you have in your mouth. You might not know it about it, but when you have a well balanced dish, it feels exciting. It feels creamy. It feels rich. It feels just seasoned enough, it feels crunchy, like all these things come together. Um, it, it's, just, it's just, literally, it's, it's like building a house. You know exactly what's needed. You just figure it out, if this is the ground, this is the place. You need to keep trying new things. A cookbook, a cooking show, you know what I mean? Do, do, do Just explore yourself and just take your time to do it. The mushroom tartine won't, you won't take you really that long, you know what I mean? It literally is mushrooms. So what I do is I roast the garlic, I roast the shallots, I hit them with the mushrooms, right? Roast those off. Then I hit it with white wine, a chablis, but you know, it's not really good. <laughs> um, and then I reduce that down, and then I add cream, a good amount of cream, and I reduce that down again. Reducing just means you're evaporating water that's in it. Here comes a balance. You're reducing down liquid and the fat content will rise. The fat content gets too high, you break. That is a greasy spaghetti. Spaghetti should not be greasy, spaghetti should be coated with a nice beurre fondue, whatever you want. So you reduce it down, you don't want to reduce it down too far because else it breaks on you. And what that means is now you have all this grease running out of that. Reduce it down so it's just coated. Then I add a little bit of chopped herbs. If you have parsley, add a little bit of rosemary, a little bit of you know the, the herbs that don't go overpower the mushrooms. Salt and pepper. That's it. So you have five ingredients in there. I thought, I thought you said there was honey and ginger. Too. Oh well, that comes later. Now comes. <laughs> so right now, what you have is you have a piece of brioche. I also made with butter. Piece of brioche. You have that creamy mushroom. That is also mushrooms. You know. It, it, kind of more on the creamier side, you need something to cut into it. Here we cut it, and so you cut it with vinegar. Right? The vinegar then has to be sweetened, because honey and mushrooms and brioche go together really well too. So you sweeten up that vinegar. And again, as I said before, I take that vinegar and reduce it down. It's a lot of reductions in the kitchen. Um, reduce it down until it's almost thick. Then you add the honey and the truffle, if you like truffle. And, that's, that's, and then we puree it up. And that's what you drizzle over that. So again, you're adding a little bit more sweetness, but you're adding acidity. And that's what you were really looking for. That's what kept you like, ooh, this is nice. Thank you. And I think we have the recipe. Do we have the recipe <coughs> online? Yeah, yeah. We did a whole lot because people always ask questions, like especially guests, and they're like, oh, how do you do it? How do you make it? And so we did, we did some recipes, not all of it. On your website? We, can you get it on our website? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. We did write, we did write that one yeah. out. Um, and what do you think, uh, Michael, is the most common mistake that the typical household chef makes? Fear. You're afraid. You're so afraid to undercook the chicken that it just totally dries out. And so it, it, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with a thermometer. Try a thermometer. So 165 is not 175, it's not 185, it is 165. And with that said, that's what chicken needs to be cooked at. So you just don't, you know, you fear of salmonella. Now, that said, in Hawaii, my best friend, you know, he likes his chicken being rare. Now, I'm not suggesting you're doing that. <laughs> what I'm suggesting to you to do is go buy three chicken breasts and cook each one a little different. One you think it's going to be totally undercooked. And the other one, it's going to be, you know, the way you make it. That's what the issue is. Same thing with fish. You know what I mean? When is it done? Most famous, you know, chef's response is, when is it done? Well, when it's done. It's when it's done. <laughs> um, but if, if the way you like it, like salmon, I love salmon, but I cannot, sta I, I can't stand overcooked salmon. Because it changes the entire dynamic of salmon. 
it has this rich creaminess to it. And if you cook it long enough, it becomes more like a like cooked tuna. It's like you know tuna too. So basically, anything you can eat raw, you're probably only going to overcook. Right? For in my thing, but for that is really learn how to cook. Either become a technician, use a thermometer, go internal temperature, find out how that works, um, and then realize that pretty much every book is wrong about those temperatures. You got to go lower than that if you want it rare, right? So for me, a rare is like 108 degree for a steak, not whatever they say, whatever. So test it. Really go test on it. Just just figure out where where are your hangups, where are your you know. For being on a, and I was wrote to sir, so eventually temperature became second nature. You know what I mean? You knew even like just the way you cooked it, you put it in the oven for a certain time, that this is gonna be proper, you touch it. But when they tell you like to touch here and here and whatever, get a thermometer, a good one. <laughs> You're so much better off because especially, I think one of the hardest things to cook is a hamburger. Okay, out of any anyone can tell you that a hamburger is the hardest thing to cook. So if somebody tells you like I want a rare, medium rare, whatever, medium well, whatever it is with the burgers, because the texture does not really change, right? And while well, I'm telling you this, I will never have a restaurant again that serves the hamburger because everybody's so very specific about how they eat it. I think it's probably one of the most perfect sandwiches made, if it's done properly. <laughs> but again, a thermometer will really help you out. I would sure to get really crispy chicken. Any te tips or techniques? Can you start with a high temperature and then reduce it down to low? Like say at a 425 and then go down. Yeah. Okay, I got in trouble for that one at Disney World because <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I said is don't flip the bird. Okay. Right, so don't flip the bird. But what I'm saying to you is this. So in, 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 in cooking, the skin of a chicken is like, it, we call it like it's a religion, right? Because you don't want to damage the skin of a chicken, you want it crispy. So what we did is we open up the chicken, that's what we do at Microsoft, we open up the entire chicken, take it off the bone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we open it up, take all the bones out. Yeah. And so it lays flat in the pan, and you sear it off, but just on low heat, get it nice, a little bit of brown. Then we put it in the oven. And so I call that the violence of an oven. You have it at 450, 400 degrees. That violence gets circulated, or you have a bottom heat. And you want that chicken, the skin, to just stay there and render out all the fat that's still in there. Same goes with a duck. A duck breast is only as good as if you render it out and it gets really nice and crispy. So with the chicken, the same thing. And never flip it over to the other side. Because the moment you have a chicken breast that is brown on the outside, whatever is brown on the outside is pretty chewy, it's pretty tough. So if you have the chance to open the chicken, and you can also put seasoning on there, you can put some herbs on there, but leave it with the skin side down until you take it out of the pan and serve it. And that skin is gonna be absolutely crispy. And just what you do is you just basically make cracklings. You know, that bottom part is a little bit in fat, but not that much, but you're rendering it out. So you're basically making, when we had made that before, make chicken cracklings out of the skin. But so you don't ever turn it over. You cook the chicken all the way, the thigh, the, the breast, everything is cooked with that skin side down. Okay. Interesting. So if you like, see, I love crispy skin. I can't, I can't understand. I also love crispy skin on salmon. Salmon, that skin, it just like goes down in the pan and just gets crispy, 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 and it's like this layer of seafood tasting salty. Oh, it's a beautiful seafood crack. <laughs> so, well, I think we should probably wrap up for tonight. I want to thank you all for coming and for uh, asking great questions. I want to thank Michael especially and Laura for bringing uh, your mushroom tartine and your wisdom to us. Uh, and uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah.